And that means our big crowd start assembling here at the Moore's Marinade Celebrity Chef stage. Thank you all for coming. They're about to start making their way back from the ex exhibition hall. Let me introduce to you our featured chef at this time. Right now, you can find him at The Ranch right here in Los Salinas, or you may find him at, and I told him this earlier, my favorite name for a restaurant in all of Texas, Whiskey Cake. That's like the two greatest things in the world, isn't it? Whiskey Cake down in Plano or Velvet Taco, which sounds like uh, a stripper. But enough about that, Chef. I apologize. Over in Dallas, trained at Johnson & Wales Culinary Institute in Providence, Rhode Island. So he's one of those. But he's back in Dallas now. Been here for 20 years, 25 years? Uh, probably about 18 years, yeah. 18 years, yeah. So he, he's, he is one of us now. And he is going to, I'm not even going to tell you what he's going to make. He says it so much better than I do, and you're going to eat it <laughs> so wonderfully when he finishes. Would you please welcome, from the ranch here in Las Colinas, Chef John Frankie. Chef? Hello, how's everybody doing today? So, um, who here has heard of the ranch at Las Colinas? It's like a stone's throw away. That's pretty good. So, this side of the room has all heard of it, this side has not. So, I'll pay attention to you guys, and you just uh, keep sitting there. I'll give you some samples later. But we have the ranch at Las Colinas which is right across the way here, uh, right down 114 in MacArthur. We've been there about four and a half years, and our big claim to fame there is that we do things as local as we can get it. Um, we do Texas cuisine. So we have a lot of fun stuff like meatloaf and you know chicken fried steak and fried chicken. We also do uh, striped bass, and we have some uh, redfish there that's all farm raised in Texas. Our chicken is all from Texas, our eggs. Um, you name it, if we can get it from Texas, we're going to get it. We grind our own burgers there. We do all kinds of fun stuff. And a lot of our food, being that it's a Texas restaurant, is a little bit spicy. So it's real appropriate that we're over here today demonstrating some of the stuff here. So we kind of have this big, long spread of various things. We've got some chilies that are grilling here. We've got some marble potato salad we're going to make, some smoked chili, uh, charred chili butter. We're going to uh, sear off a flat iron steak and kind of put it all together so all this is going to turn into one plate. It's kind of my favorite thing about cooking. Is you can open your pantry, open your refrigerator, go to the grocery store, whatever. You come home with all this stuff, and the next thing you know, you have a cool little plate of food, and everybody likes it, or they don't like it, and you try again. So we have a couple other restaurants as well, Whiskey Cake in Plano, and then we also have Velvet Taco, which is down uh, Henderson and 75. So what I'm going to do, um, I don't have any recipes for you, but you can follow along. We do give out all of our recipes for all of our menu items in all of our different restaurants that we have. We have about 35 total restaurants. We have a couple other uh, chain restaurants that we do as well. Um, but I'm going to start here with marble potato salad to get the potatoes cooking. And then just kind of work down here. And um, I might burn a couple things. I might screw a couple things up. So just bear with me. Um, this is live and in action. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start with marble potatoes. And these are fun little potatoes that you can get. It's called marble just because they're different colors. They're fingerling potatoes, basically. Fingerling, meaning they look like a finger. Um, there's uh, Yukon Gold, there's Red Bliss, and then there's Purple Potatoes here, Peruvian Potatoes. So I'm going to throw these in a bowl. This is, some, this is a really cool uh, potato salad that you can make at home. Um, and it's really simple, just roasting potatoes. So we've got some chopped garlic, you can buy that. We've got kosher salt going in there, and we've got some coarse black pepper. And I'm a big fan of coarse black pepper and kosher salt because they have more body to them. If you just use regular, real fine grain, iodized salt, you lose kind of control of how to season a burger, a steak, a chicken, um, how to season dressings and those kind of things. You just, there's so much salt in one little punch um, that you kind of, you get, you get this salty effect instead of sort of this rounded out effect. The idea of salt is to sort of bring all the flavors together. It's not to make things salty. So if your food tastes like salt, then uh, that's a bad sign. You sort of overdid it. You put something in there and it starts bringing out all the vibrant flavors. Um, so I'm going to put a couple of things in there. I'm going to talk about some of these herbs over here. So um, we've got fresh herbs that are going to be going in there. And we get all of our herbs locally from Stephenville, Texas, out of a little farm down there called Tascione Farms. Um, it's delivered twice a week to us. And so I've got some oregano here. I've got some thyme. I've got some rosemary. You could do whatever herbs suits your fancy. It really doesn't matter. Somebody says fresh herbs, use fresh herbs. Um, the herbs that come in a little container that say basil, oregano, and they're dried, there's not much going on in there. It's kind of you're just messing with little pieces of cardboard. So you're better off getting fresh herbs. But the problem is, is there's sort of a uh, conspiracy, I think, in grocery stores that you get about this much rosemary for about $3, and it's in a little teeny plastic container shoved up in the corner, and it's usually dying and black. And then you could, you know, like I get, 
you know, a pound of rosemary for $9. So, um, you know, the best thing to do is just grow your own herbs. But if you don't want to do that, fine. Go buy, waste your money on fresh herbs in the produce department. But anyway, so I've got rosemary. If you see what I'm doing here, it's just trying to pull, uh, not having all the stems. So if it, it's really hard to get the leaves off if you pull with them. So if you just kind of pull it up and you pull right down against the, the way the leaves are flowing, then you're left with the stem. A lot of people use these at home, like to skewer fish or meat or something, grill on the grill. You could do that. And then we've also got some parsley right here. So getting confused. So what I'm going to do is I'll just chop this up like this. It's really important with herbs. Um, rosemary, oregano, and thyme, you can you kind of have some leeway on um, as far as chopping them up. But you want to be real careful when you go to chop things like parsley or cilantro or basil. Because if you sit there and you, and you kill the herb on the cutting board, what you're doing is you're just bruising it. And so you'll notice, like if you make a marinara sauce or something at home and you chop and basil, chop and basil, and, and like 20 minutes later you come back to it and it's black. And that's just because you basically, everything has come out of that basil um, and it's just left on the cutting board and you're left with this sort of this black, nasty herb. And like I said, the rougher herbs, rosemary, oregano, thyme, you're pretty safe with. Even parsley you can chop, you know, till there's not much left of it. Um, but cilantro, basil, like I said, those you want to be careful. So this is just, I'm going to take this parsley, again, locally sourced. Um, if we can get it local, we will. Same thing with whiskey cake and velvet taco. And we're just going to chop this up. So pretend like I chopped this up really good. And voila, what I'm left with is a nice little mix of chopped herbs here. Um, so I'm going to throw that in there. And that just gives you a nice rounded flavor. The parsley doesn't have a whole lot of punch to it. Um, it doesn't... Uh, you know, add a ton of flavor, but the thyme, rosemary, and oregano do, and the parsley just helps sort of add that greenery, add that baseline uh, herb flavor to it, and it's really good. Parsley is great um, for in stocks and sauces and all kinds of stuff. So what I'm going to do here, another Texas product, like I said, if we can get it locally sourced, we will. Um, these guys, I don't think they'd be here today, but Texas Olive Ranch is out of Carrizo Springs, Texas, and they have a great olive oil you can get. You can get it at Central Market. It is not cheap. So we, we use it, but we tend to use it um, sparingly, and then we'll use olive oil or some other kind of oils and stuff a lot of times, cottonseed oil. So what I'm going to do is just mix these up. You can see this is real simple, and this is super herby, covered in all those uh, herbs, I guess, so it makes it herby. Um, so you take a pan here, you take a cookie sheet at home, um, you can also do these, like put them, wrap them in foil, put them on your grill or whatever. So I'm going to throw these in. Um, let's see. Let's see if those get done. If they don't, we'll pretend. So, but anyway, but cooking potatoes is fun. It's easy. Um, you, you know, again, you could do that same recipe with any kind of potato. What you want to be careful of doing when you're making uh, some kind of salad like this is if you boil the potatoes, if you cut them first and boil them, you're basically going to end up with mashed potatoes. So if you took like a, a, a red potato, you know, most people have seen red potatoes. You don't see these at the store very often. You see a red potato a little bigger than that. And you, um, you know, you, you sit there and let's say you were to say, oh, I'm going to make potato salad. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dice it up first. You know, I'm going to chop it up and I'm going to throw it in water. And then what you're going to be left with is just mashed up potatoes. So you're better off if you're going to boil them, leaving them whole and the skin will protect it, and you cook them, let's say, 15, 20, 30 minutes, depending on the size of the potato, and then once they're cooled down, then you would cut them, and they still have their form. And so it would be a little better for a potato salad rather than mush. Um, you do it with a big potato as well. If you want to take a whole potato and you roast it, bake it, uh, boil it real slow, and then once it's done, you cool down, you dice it up, and you'll have a better dice to it. So little trick of the trade there. Um, so what I have over here is these... You, this uh, looks horribly burnt and gross peppers, but actually this is a really good thing. So we're going to move on. We're going to make this smoked chili butter. So just kind of stay with me because we're making various things to finish off this plate. Um, but what I'm uh, actually I say smoked chili because that's what we do at the ranch. We actually smoke the chilies. I just don't want to smoke the place out. So I could change this up charred chili butter. So um, just so you know what we're doing here, what we're making eventually is a warm marble Potato, warm marble potato salad with a charred chili butter over a flat iron steak. So I didn't, I didn't say that yet, so you've just been following along with me. Um, but anyway, so I had this little indoor grill here. Um, you could do this outside. You could do this in the oven. Um, you could do whatever you want. But the, but the best way to use chilies and to get the most flavor really out of any kind of food product is to roast it or cook it first. 
So if I took raw chilies, uh, jalapenos, poblanos, habaneros, Fresno peppers, whatever Anaheim peppers, whatever kind of pepper you had, and I, and I diced it up raw, and I use it in a slaw or a salad or a dressing, I'm not going to get the same effect as if I roasted it. I'll get a sharper uh, flavor. It'll be a little spicier. When you roast it, you kind of calm down the spice. Some of the natural sugars come out. So you end up, you kind of level it out. Some of the sweetness matches with the heat. And then you also add just sort of another complexity, a little roasted flavor, kind of gives you a, a more balance to the pepper. So what I have here is I have some jalapenos, some Fresno peppers, and uh, poblano peppers. So you haven't heard of a Fresno pepper? Looks like this. It is not a jalapeno pepper. It's a little bit less spicy. Um, obviously, you know what a jalapeno is. You could do serrano peppers. They're a little bit thinner than a jalapeno, a little more concentrated flavor. Um, you could do whatever. So what I did is imagine this was outside, and I'm going to put these in a bowl. They're hot. And the best trick to this is if you took some plastic wrap, um, what do you call that, saran wrap, I guess, at home? So, and you cover this a lot better than I'm doing. And what it'll do when the peppers are hot, if, you, if you're grilling them outside or you're roasting them in the oven, you want to be able to get that skin off. Because obviously, you don't want all that charred black skin on there. But you need it to be black, and that'll tell you that it's done. So what you're left with is just um, peppers that are, I'm going to put that there, that'll burn up, um, that are steaming in there. And so in like, let's say 15 minutes or so, you go to use them and you're just going to peel that skin right off and it'll just, it'll fly right off. And it, it's better than, again, if you're going to roast it, it'd be better than having black stuff all laying around. So um, let's see. So I'm going to let those sit for a second. What I'm going to do is I'm going to work on the dressing for the marble potato salad. And like I said, we give out all of our recipes. So um, got some business cards. You can check us out on the ranch, uh, on the ranch Los Finis online, whiskey cake, velvet tuck, whatever. Look it up write me and say, hey, I was there and I'd love the recipe for it. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to make this uh, honey Dijon dressing. It's a really great dressing for salads. It's great for potato salad, obviously. Um, what it is, we got mayonnaise and we got Dijon mustard. Two things that most people have laying around. If you don't have Dijon, use, you know, whatever. Use brown mustard, Creole mustard, spicy mustard, you know, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to put some honey in there, the honey Dijon. So this honey right here, just to make things simple, I already portioned it out. But this is what we use at, the, at all three of those restaurants is Round Rock Honey um, right out of Round Rock, Texas. Uh, it's a great local product. There's a lot of different honeys um, in Texas that are available. These guys are just great. Um, they're good to us, and they uh, deliver. So that's good. I have roasted garlic. The best way to do roasted garlic, well, the easiest way to do roasted garlic is buy it. The second easiest way to do it is if you buy like a clove of garlic, um, don't peel it, don't do anything. It's super cheap in any produce section in the, in the country. You wrap it in foil, you throw it in your oven, you come back in 30 or 45 minutes, the house smells like garlic, smells good, it's pungent. Um, you bring it out of, the, out, of the, out of the oven, you sit it down, let it cool down for a little bit, and then I don't have one here, but imagine this is a clove of garlic, and if you slice straight down like that, and you're left sort of with the exposed garlic, and you just push it out like a tube of toothpaste almost, and you'll have phenomenal Roasted garlic, it's super easy, super cheap. I would imagine buying roasted garlic already done is, let's say, it's $3 for a little jar. You could buy a clove of garlic for, what, like 25 cents or something and get the same effect. So, um, and then I'm just going to put some simple seasonings in here. Again, coarse black pepper, just for some more control. You can be able to see the pepper in there. Some salt, some red chili flakes for some spice. And this is rice vinegar. So uh, seasoned rice vinegar is a great vinegar to have in your house. Um, there's rice wine vinegar, which is just rice wine. It's rice vinegar made from rice. Or there's seasoned rice wine vinegar, which has a little bit of salt and a little bit of sugar in it. And it's a great, very, very calm vinegar to have around. I always tell people, you know, white vinegar. Everybody has white vinegar in their house. That's great for cleaning, and that's great for whatever crazy thing you want to do. But it's not great for cooking. Uh, better vinegars are red wine vinegar, apple cider vinegar. Those are a little bit more pungent. Um, cherry vinegar, balsamic vinegar. I mean, there's all kinds of vinegars, but rice wine vinegar is used in a lot of Asian cooking because it's sweeter. So if you go to like have spring rolls somewhere and it's got this kind of clear liquid that you're dipping your spring roll in, that's rice vinegar with a little bit of something else that they might put in there. But um, we use it a lot in the restaurants because it is a little bit, it gives you the twang of vinegar without overpowering everything else. So all I'm going to do is mix this up. It's a simple, simple, simple dressing. Um, you know, again, mayonnaise, Dijon mustard, roasted garlic, a little bit of rice wine vinegar, 
uh, some chili flakes. You can put any kind of spice in there and salt and pepper. It's super duper duper simple. Um, and I always, you know, try to tell people, you know, it's like everybody's got oil and vinegar. So why go to the store and buy dressing? Like, you know, it's fine. You buy the dressing. You know what it is. You know, you're not a great cook, whatever. That's fine. But, you know, three parts oil to one part vinegar. Or it might be the other way around. I never remember. But anyway, oil and vinegar. You put it together. You make a dressing. And everybody will think you're great. You'll be like, wow, you're the greatest cook in the world. It's like, yeah, well, I put two ingredients together and threw some seasonings in there. And I'm great. So um, what we're going to do is I'm going to move on to the smoked chili butter. So we've got our potatoes roasting. We've got our dressing for the potato salad. And we're going to cook our steak in a minute here. And we have, um, actually what I'm going to do, this is also for the, uh, what you call it, potato salad, is how to make some bacon bits. So, you know, you could, again, you could buy bacos, you could buy bacon bits, whatever. You could also cook bacon. There's nothing better than a little bit of bacon to start your day. And we use a lot of bacon at the ranch. Um, we use a lot of bacon fat. People ask me, why are your ribs so good? It's like, well, when they come out of the oven, we lather them with bacon fat and then put barbecue sauce on them. And people think, oh, well, never mind. So, but this is some Applewood smoked bacon right here. It's nice and thick. It's great to get thick bacon. Um, and you know, with bacon, you can buy cheap bacon. And typically, the cheaper bacon is just a lot of fat. So you'll notice like when you go to cook it in your house and you cook it in a, in a pan, and then it shrinks up, there's not much left because it's just all fat. You're paying for the fat. So certainly you get the bacon fat and you can use that in cooking or whatever, but you want to get something that's a little bit more meaty. Applewood smoked bacon is typically fairly expensive, um, but it, you know, it's again, it, it's hard to tell, but there is a lot of meat on this. If I had another regular piece of bacon, just like a Kroger brand or something piece of bacon, you'd see the difference. It's pretty amazing. So there's a couple ways. You can make bacon bits, like throw the bacon in the oven or put it in a pan whole. Um, the best way to do it, and you get the most even kind of feel out of it, is to just take it, dice it up little pieces, and then cook it just like this. So you're basically taking these little nuggets, I guess, these little pieces, little dice pieces, and turning them into bacon bits. So it's, it just looks a little, little better than if you took a slice of bacon that was uh, cooking and then chopped it up because you're going to get a lot more grease that way. It's not going to look as nice. My goodness gracious, my little knife here is no good. Um, and it's always good to use a sharp knife, so do not use my example when cooking at home. More people cut themselves with dull knives than sharp knives, if you believe it or not. Okay, so, so this is bacon. I'm probably going to burn this place down, so I'm going to try one piece. Yeah, that's okay. So I got a little cast iron skillet here. Use whatever. Cast iron is always good to cook with because um, it's, a, it, again, kind of like with the rice vinegar. It just it, it allows you to have some leeway. You're not going to kill yourself. Um, cooking with that so you know you could if I got like that little pan over there for a steak you know if I cook bacon there right now if it was hot it would just burn the place down um, but you know cast iron tends to be a little bit better you got to season it anybody that hasn't cooked with cast iron it's real simple those of you who have understand it um, you basically buy a cast iron pan it's not ready to be cooked with you have to kind of rub you boil it in water you put some water in it boil it for about an hour that kind of helps that pan finish off and then you um, dry it out, you put it in the oven with a little bit of oil. It could be any kind of oil um, that you want. Put it in the oven for about at 350 for about an hour or two. You flip it upside down, you turn your oven off, and you let it sit overnight. And what that does is called seasoning the pan. And it just allows you to, it basically bakes in that little bit of oil that you put on it. And a cast iron skillet's nothing you ever want to put in the dishwasher. You want to just use it, wipe it out, put it on the shelf, and it's done. Otherwise, it'll rust. And every time you wash in the dishwasher, it will, um, it will tend to uh, work kind of that enamel. I don't know if enamel is the wrong word, but sort of work that seasoning off, uh, and it'll keep breaking it down. Um, but, you, you know, obviously you want to sanitize it, clean it. Use a little soap, water, whatever. Uh, if you're at home, it doesn't matter. So um, in the restaurants, we wash them actually in the dishwasher, but each, we season them each night. So, so anyway, so that's bacon. So that's another little trick to bacon. One more thing here is our smoked chili butter. So again, buying local. What I've got here is Lucky Layla Farms butter. This is, again, <laughs> I'm telling you some ways to be cheap, some ways to not be cheap. This is not cheap. This is not necessarily the, the, the only way to go, but it's a very, uh, it's a sweet cream butter. Um, it's extremely good. It's Guernsey and Jersey cows that are uh, raised in Plano, and then they uh, send the milk over to Garland and there's a, a little place there called Lucky Layla Farms, or Lucky Layla, well, it's 
it's different. But the, the cows are raised at Lucky Layla Farms. The, the, the butter is made just down the road in Garland. Um, and it's like the real deal. I mean, this is heavy duty stuff. It's about $6 a pound. So I've got some working in here. And what I'm doing is the, the best way to make any kind of compound butter. And again, this is easy stuff. So I'm up here in a little fancy chef coat. I went to culinary school, so I guess I know more. It's not true, okay? You guys know just as much as I do. I just pretend like I know what I'm doing. Um, and so when you're at home, look, everybody's got butter in their fridge. Even if you have margarine. Margarine won't necessarily work, um, but you could still, you know, mix stuff into it and brush it on top of stuff. So instead of just grilling a steak out back and having salt and pepper on it, you go buy kosher salt, you go buy coarse ground black pepper, and you take some butter that you have, impress your neighbors, impress your friends, and you know, be out there grilling, and then start brushing it with butter. Um, and the easiest way to do it, not everybody has one of these, you could leave your butter out overnight. It's completely safe, and you could um, let it get real soft. You put it in a bowl, just any kind of mixing bowl like this, you know, and just start mixing it, um, getting it real soft. You could use a whisk, you could use a spoon, and just put some stuff in it. You might have, like, you want to make strawberry butter, you know, for breakfast. Take some strawberry jelly or jam out of your cooler, out of your refrigerator, throw it in the butter, mix it up, put some sugar in it, and look, everybody's going to think you bought, like, you know, Aunt Lucy's strawberry butter at the farmer's market for $7 a uh, little pint, and little do you know, you made it yourself. So this is a uh, charred chili butter, smoked chili butter, whatever you want to call it. Um, you could put just cilantro, you could put just lime, make a lime butter, orange butter. There's a million different things you can make. Um, in culinary school, they throw out all these French terms at you. There's maitre d' hotel butter, and there's all kinds of other nonsense butters that, you know, people who are still living in the 80s and working on cruise ships make. But we're doing some stuff that is a little bit more innovative these days. Um, so I'm not going to sit here and, and bore you all for the next 15 minutes it would take me to peel all these chilies. Um, but so you get the idea here. I'm making this real soft. And then what I'm going to do with these chilies, so they've been on the grill outside, they've been in the oven, wherever. Let me make sure I'm not burning anything else up here. Um, wow, impressive. The potatoes aren't burnt yet. So um, you let them sit, okay? And so see how this peel is just kind of popping off of here? So anybody who's charred peppers at home um, and been frustrated to no end, this is your answer. But if you've charred them and just thrown it into the whatever you're making, like if you're making salsa, for example, sometimes you'd want some of the skin in there. You'd want some of that charred flavor. So I'm going to take some of the seeds out. As you, most of you being at Zest Fest know, the seeds aren't where the heat's coming from. It's just from the, um, the membrane on the inside of the pepper. The seeds certainly add a little bit. If anything, they're just kind of a nuisance. They just sort of get in your way. Uh, they make salsas and, and things like that not look as good. But this is also a great way to make salsa, you know, doing some of the peppers like this and some of the peppers just straight in. You know, our salsa at the ranch, we do uh, charred tomatoes on the grill, charred jalapenos, charred poblanos. And then we, um, and we don't even peel them. We just throw it right in there uh, because there's not a lot of them. And we, um, you know, and it gives it sort of a dark complexity flavor. It's not bitter or anything. What would be bitter is if you put a lot of, if you put the stems in there or if you put a lot of seeds. Like you start putting a lot of seeds and then you blend it or you're chopping them up, you're going to start getting some bitter flavors in there. So you want to be careful. Now what I would, rec so something like this with a butter, what you'd want to do, and I'm going to just do a jalapeno, a poblano, and a fresno. What you'd want to do is put it in a blender. And I don't want to bring all that jazz here today. Most of you look like you're just hungry and ready to eat and done with me talking. So I'll hurry up as fast as I can. But so I'm just taking all this mess out of here. And I can't stand touching food. I got to tell you. So I always wear these gloves. <laughs> so um, I know that sounds weird, but it's like last thing I want to do is come home smelling like what I've been cooking all day. So I tend to wear gloves a lot, especially when we're doing raw meats and stuff like that, like bacon. So you get the idea here on the bacon. So I'm going to avoid burning this whole pan. But So you keep cooking, keep cooking real slow and low. And what you end up with, once you've done with that, you strain the bacon grease off. And you kind of have, I don't know if you can hear that, but, you know, just crispy little bacon bits. Okay? It's a lot better, a lot more consistent um, to have that. So anyway, we're moving on back here to the smoked chili butter. I have my knife. And I should be sanitizing this knife, but no one's going to eat this. So... I'm just going to wipe this off. I'm sure all of you have a uh, three compartment sink at your home with uh, washing and rinsing and sanitizing. But so, which I know is not true, but at the restaurant we would have washed that. I was looking for another knife. I couldn't find it. So here we go. So we're just going to chop this up. Again, poblanos, fresnos, jalapenos, however hot you want it. So you want to make uh, a butter that's super hot. Obviously use habaneros, ghost chilies, 
um, you know, whatever other kind of chili you want to use. There's plenty of hot stuff here. You know, another good idea, if you want to make something pretty cool, is you get all these different salsas here, right? All these different hot sauces. So you take some butter, you put it out overnight, you mix it up with your hands or with a spoon or whisk, or you put it in one of these if you have one, or a, if you have a Cuisinart, if you have a, a blender, it might not work, but a Cuisinart would definitely work. And you throw it in there and put some hot sauce in it, put some salsas in it, put whatever, and you're going to end up with some pretty cool butters um, that you can use to, you know, brush on some chicken, brush on some steaks, pork chops, whatever. So if you're a big outdoor grill person, you know, butter is just a great thing to add. Um, and, and again, you could probably do it with margarine. Margarine is just oil, so I would imagine on the grill it might get, you know, kind of burn up a little bit more, but it definitely will have a higher, you know, capacity to burn than, um, than butter would, so I'm hoping that's going to be okay there. So anyway, so you get the idea. Then what I'm doing here is just to um, flavor this up. Again, all these things I would dare to say the majority of you have in your cupboards, and you didn't even realize it. So... I've got butter, which everybody's got some form of butter. Um, you got the chili, so you may not have that. You go out to your garden or buy, buy a jar of salsa. I got some Worcestershire sauce here. I've got some smoked paprika. You can just use regular paprika. I've got Tabasco sauce or whatever hot sauce you want to use. I've got some pepper. I've got some kosher salt. I've got lime juice. I think that's lime juice. <laughs> you know, it's chicken stock. So we use a little chicken stock to put, um, to kind of loosen the butter up. You don't have to use chicken stock, it's just an, it's an ingredient we use. And then we've got some lime juice here. And that lime juice, obviously everything does something. The paprika is gonna give you a little color. The Tabasco is gonna give you a little bit of heat, but obviously you could put a drop of some kind of deadly, you know, death sauce that they're selling here. Um, and we've got, you know, the Worcestershire kind of gives it a roundedness, a body to it. Great for steaks, obviously. Um, you could put A1 steak sauce in there. You could put whatever. I mean, it does not matter. To me, cooking is funny. I see people, you know, I have like interns or maybe somebody, you know, a family member says, oh my gosh, I got this great recipe and, you know, I got it out of a magazine and, and it didn't work that well and, or I, I had to do it just this and it says just this. Like, look, recipes are a template. They're just there to kind of help you, um, you know, and, and it's just inspiration. So, like, I'll open magazines. I use Bon Appetit, Food and Wine, go online, watch the Food Network. And I'll see one sauce, and that one sauce there, that one ingredient that someone's using, I'll be like, man, I'll be inspired by that. So maybe somebody has a cactus pear salsa or something like, man, I could do a cactus pear taco at Velvet Taco. I could do cactus pear reduction and do a dessert out of it. So I get inspired by it. So it's not like you have to live by these recipes. So especially like if somebody were to write me, you know, this weekend and say, hey, I saw you at Zest Fest, I'd love a recipe for that, whatever. Be like, look, that's fine. Take the recipe, but do something else with it. Don't live by it like it's the only way to live life, you know. So anyway, so that's it. So what we have here is this nice soft butter. Um, I'm sure you can all taste it from there. And, um, you know, it's going to be a great thing to put on our steaks. So I'm going to take this. How am I doing on, uh, I just got an iPhone the other day. I've had a BlackBerry forever, so it's very new to me. So I'll make sure. I know how to tell time on it. Um, all right, so anyway, you know, and we're going to put this like this and, and, you know, put in a fancy bowl. Everybody thinks everything tastes better when it's in a fancy bowl. So when your friends come over, this looks like dip. Tell somebody it's a uh, charred chili dip and they'll dip a cracker in it. They'll probably love it. It tastes like butter. So um, anyway, so that's our butter that we're going to use. Let me get this out of the way. Oh, my gosh. Good thing that wasn't a knife or something. Turned it on. So what we're left with is a steak. We got to cook that, right? And we got to get our potatoes out of the oven and then we're almost done. So I've got this pan over here, a lot of different ways to cook steak. I could have heated this thing up and cooked it. It would take a little bit longer than this than like an outdoor grill. Um, so I'm just going to put it in a, in a saute pan and we're going to hope for the best here. Um, again, you've got your flat iron steak and you know, you don't have to buy surgical gloves at home because I'm a sissy boy. But um, also just because I'm touching a lot of different stuff, I don't want to be digging my hands on raw meat and bacon and everything and then coming back. So, but we've got a saute pan here. You do this inside, you're asking for trouble. It's going to be, it's going to smoke your house out. But you could definitely, if, if you like the, the, the feel, you're more of a McDonald's person than a Burger King person, so you like a seared burger versus a grilled burger. So, you know, you could sear your steaks, you could grill your steaks, you could roast your steaks, whatever you want to do. The best thing to do though with a steak, with a steak, is to get a good sear on the outside. What that does um, you think it's sealing in all the juices. It's actually not. I won't go into all the science behind it. 
but it's given you a nice caramelization on the outside. Um, it's an old wives' tale that by hitting something hard seals everything in. That's not true, but you know, if you want to live by that, that's fine. It doesn't hurt my feelings. Um, I won't get in an argument about it. So I'm going to put a little bit of oil. Yeah, that might be all right. So um, when when sautéing, cooking at home, anything that's hot. When you're cooking in a sauté pan, you want to see it smoke and you want to hear it sizzle. Okay. If you take a pan and go, hey, honey, I'm going to make a steak and I'm going to cure a piece of chicken or a piece of fish. Let me get that pan. And you take that cold pan, you put it on the grill or put it on the, on the burners, put some oil, put the piece of fish in it, it just sits there. And you wonder why it all stuck to the pan. That's why. So well, you need to get this thing super hot. So when it comes out, I mean, when it starts cooking, you, um, you sear it on the outside. So you want to get some good color. You don't necessarily need oil in a pan. It's better to use oil. Obviously, in a grill, you don't need to put oil or anything on a steak. Steaks always have their own marbleization in them, so it's really not a huge deal. Um, so that's our steak. We got our dressing. We got. Our, I'm looking to see if I missed anything. I'm gonna. Um, hmm. Those are almost done too. I'm impressed. Okay. So nobody else is, but that's okay. So I'm gonna um, keep making this. We're almost. They're probably plating in the back right now. So you, you know, on medium rare, medium, whatever, this is a flat iron steak. Um, you could cook any steak any way you want it. It's your, it's your home, it's your business, whatever. Um, you know, people recommend medium rare just because you get the most flavor out of it. You get the most tenderness out of it. You start getting into medium well and well done. Um, you're going to lose a lot of the complexities of that steak and, um, you know, what you should be doing. But look, you don't want to see red in your meat. By all means, don't put red in your meat. So it's not a big deal. Um, but flat irons are a great steak. Um, a lot of people haven't heard of flat irons um, unless you've been out uh, in the last five years or so. It's kind of a newer steak, probably in the last, oh, I don't know, eight years or so. But um, when you go to the grocery store and you buy a sirloin steak, so it's in that sort of styrofoam tray. It's long. It's about a half inch, inch thick. It's this big old kind of Fred Flintstone looking steak. There's three or four different parts to that steak. Some are more tender than others. But there's one, there's one part of it that's probably like, you know, well, it looks like <laughs> this. So it's this part right here. So you have this, and then there's some steak here, and there's some steak here. That's where that flat iron is. It comes right there. It's in the shoulder area of the of the steer, and it's it's just this piece that's kind of jetting up in. It's very difficult to get to, um, and it's very difficult to um, cut out. So it almost looks like a brisket. It's a big thing. It's got two parts to it, and there's this big old vein and this big old silver skin that runs through it, kind of in a a very strange way, and um, so it's difficult to cut, but it's a great steak. They say, and I, it's probably a marketing thing, that it's um, you know the second most tender steak behind a tenderloin, and it, it is tender, and it is really good. So I'm just going to finish it in the oven. When you're cooking at home, um, man, I feel like Rachel Ray over here, like knocking this stuff out. Um, so when you cook at home, you if you're going to cook a steak inside, again, open the windows, turn on the vents, because it's going to be nasty. Um, but if you cook outside, you could just finish it on the grill. And, you do, and this is what a lot of people do. I always make fun of uh, guys that work for me when they're, you know, they're kind of new. Or I'm watching somebody cook at home. And they'll be cooking something, and they do this. They keep going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Or they're making this, this is like, let's say it's in a pot, and they just keep stirring it. And they think by stirring it, they're somehow adding flavor. And they keep tasting it, it's just going to get better. It's like, look, put it in the pot, leave it alone, let it be. Let it rest. Let it be fine. So a steak is the same thing. You put it down on the grill, you sear it, and you may want to turn it a couple times th this way to get some hash marks or something on it. Then you flip it over and you finish it again, and that's it. That'll be medium rare. So it's like, let's say it's a, a good size steak, inch thick, half inch thick. It's got on your grill. Your grill's hot, and you put it, you season it, you put it down. It's like a minute. I'd say like three or four minutes on one side, three or four minutes on the other side. About eight minutes will get you a flat iron steak that size. That's a 10 ounce steak. And that'll get you a perfect steak every time. If you have a 16-ounce fillet, yeah, it, the tenderloin is going to take a long time. But you don't have to sit there and keep messing with it. And it's always funny to me to watch people do that. Um, so, but I guess that's just me. So I got my potatoes here, and I, I guess I didn't overcook them. So, um, so what I'm going to do is we got potato salad, right? So every good potato salad has celery and onions. So I'm just going to cut just a little bit of celery here. Best way to do celery dice is just strip it all the way down, um, you know, get rid of the, the main, that sort of bottom part right there. Um, the leaves are very bitter. Um, these little, uh, little 
other parts of the celery are kind of bitter. Um, so you want to get that off of there. And then, you know, just dice it up. I know it looks easy, but it is. And this just gives you like a little crunch. So, you know, celery is not something you want to go grilling or roasting or anything like that. That would be sort of nasty. Um, but anyway, so we got this. And then we're going to cut the onion. And we're going to cut the potatoes up, make a little bit of potato salad. So we've got the celery right there, done with this. And then we've got the onions. So there's a lot of different ways to do onions, right? So I go to culinary school and they go, cut it this way, cut it this way, cut it this way. Um, listen, just dice the thing up, okay? Doesn't matter. Um, do it like that. That's the easiest way. So I already peeled this onion to make things easier. And I just cut it in slices and then go like this. Um, it is good to have a decent sized knife if you're comfortable using a knife. It makes your life a lot easier. I know I've been to a lot of family, friends' houses, and everybody's got like these junky little knives that they found at, you know, J.C. Penney's or something, and they, they sit there and they're like, you know, uh, they're cutting it, they're cutting these little pieces. It's like, look, just buy a big knife, you know, and just put a glove on or something so you don't get cut. Um, so what we're wet left with is I am going to mix these up in something. Let's see here. I think I just saw a bowl over here. Um, aha. All right, so. Got a bowl, I got my potatoes, got my celery and onions. So I'm going to put a little bit of onions, probably put way too many to, I don't want to sit here and cut potatoes all day to match up. So we've got our bacon, right? So that bacon's over there. I'm going to do the easy stuff right here. You got some bacon in there. And then we're going to put a little bit of salt and pepper. Let's pretend, salt and pepper. I'll put this stuff in there. Look, the person before me had kosher salt too. So there you go. So salt and pepper, okay? Every good chef's got salt and pepper readily available. Readily available. So all I'm going to do is cut these in half. You can cut them however you want. They're extremely hot. My little, my little weenie fingers are burning up. So, um, but if you see the different colors, I'm trying to get some different ones just for fun. Um, you know, and these could be cooled down, heated up later. You just eat them cold. They're really, really good. And, and purple, just so you know, purple vegetables, um, potatoes are actually, Peruvian potatoes, there's like a, hundreds of different kinds of potatoes in Peru. Um, but purple potatoes are natural, but most other things like purple carrots, purple beans, um, various other things are not naturally purple. So when you go to, if you go and you think you're going to be fancy and you go to Central Market, you get some kind of purple green bean and you go to cook it, it's going to turn green. So just FYI. But there's a way to do it where it won't turn green, which doesn't really matter because I doubt most of you are going to buy purple vegetables. But if you roast them, it kind of uh, kind of helps out, just sort of cooks a little slower. But if you were to like put them in water or something, it just, it just doesn't work. So I found out that's the hard way, doing some banquets and stuff, saying, what a great idea. And then you go to make it, and the banquet goes out, and everything's green. So what I'm going to do, put a little honey Dijon dressing in here. Those guys should be done in the back, uh, bringing some stuff out here in just a second. Ooh, my steak is probably cooking. So uh, it's probably dying over there. Um, so here you go. So we got this little potato salad. This is a really awesome salad. It's something that we sort of made up, and it, and it was by mistake almost. Um, ooh. <laughs> okay, so here we go. So what I'm going to do on this is put it right there. Okay, so we kind of made this by mistake. We wanted a potato salad. We wanted something warm, something cool, something different. We were messing around using these potatoes for something else, and then we had some of this honey mustard dressing laying around, and we mixed it up. And because we give out our recipes at the ranch, it's, it's crazy to me. It is the number one recipe that I get requests for, and it's, it's insane. Like, it's crazy to me how many people like it. And it is good, don't get me wrong. But it's like something you've never seen before. So just keep that in mind. Like, if you, don't, you get inspired from today, it's like, look, take some potatoes out of your cabinet, roast them, dice them up, throw some honey Dijon dressing in there, make some kind of mix of mayonnaise and whatever, and you're good to go. So I've got my potato salad. I've got my smoked chili butter. And what I'm going to do here is, so my, you know, my, if I was outside on the grill and I'm grilling this, this steak, don't do this in the beginning, but as the steak starts finishing, it's getting to the temperature that you want it, and then you just brush that butter on there. So that's what I was talking about. It's like just this added flavor. Like everybody has steak at home. Everybody eats meat, chicken, whatever. But if you add a little bit of butter, you're not going to kill yourself, especially if it's real butter. It's actually better for you than margarine. Um, and, you know, and you just brush it on there, and people will be like, oh, man, that's really good. So also with steaks is you want to let them rest. So when you cook a steak, 
Again, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on inside there, but you know, you cook the medium rare, medium, there's all these things that are happening and the steak is, is very, very hot in the middle and it, all the little, organ, whatever's in there, right? So imagine like little guys that are turning red. They're, um, they're running around and they're saying, you know, get me out, get me out, get me out. So if you let it rest, let it sit for about five minutes or so, any of that blood that might come out actually sort of congeals a little bit on the inside and it, and it keeps all that stuff inside keeps the color the right way so if you go to a restaurant let's say you order a medium rare steak and you get it medium but it's sliced that means somebody sliced it too soon they may have overcooked it too but um, if it comes right to your table and you cut it and the, all the blood comes right out that means that they did let it rest for a minute so a lot of times you watch like food network and stuff and you'll see these guys like running around and they'll be like oh my gosh i didn't let my steak rest um so that's what they're talking about so it's just a just a thing to let the let everything on the inside come together. So I got my little Texas plate here in homage of being from the ranch and being at this wonderful event. So, you know, we've got our local Texas olive oil, our local butter, our local honey, um, local herbs, whatever we can do. And we've got our potato salad here. All right, so I'm going to use my hands. I'm done with the gloves. So what we're going to do, we're going to pile this up. So we've got some yummy bacon, celery, onions, warm roasted potatoes. That's on there. We've got all of our little all of our smoked chili butter all over this steak right here. So I'm just going to cut this. So it's medium rare. And medium rare should be a, like a, a slightly warm red center. So um, keep that in mind when you order medium rare. Like if you, it's hard to tell from here. This side's more medium. And then we've got medium rare kind of right here. So it's kind of right in the middle. Um, it's kind of the average person's steak. I'm just going to slice that up on there. Flat irons, you don't have to slice it by any means. I'm just trying to be fancy, make it look like I know what I'm doing. I'm going to put a little bit more chili butter on there, kind of let it melt down. That's kind of what you guys have um, and what you'll be tasting. And then we've got microgreens right here. Again, locally from Stephenville, Texas, just sprinkled on top. So that's what you're, that's sort of the bigger version. This is the hoss size version of what you're getting. You're getting a little taster, but that's it. So... Fantastic. Thank you so much, Chef John Frankie from the ranch. We have sampling available at our sampling station. Hopefully we've got enough for everybody to come yeah, through. Should be. Wonderful. One more time for Chef John Frankie. And if you get a chance, it's just just down the Carpenter Parkway in Las Colinas at the ranch. Don't forget, everybody, there's still a couple of minutes left to sign up for our Wing Stop Atomic Wing Challenge. It's not too late to jump into the contest. And if you're not going to be in the contest, you've got to watch the contest. There's some sort of, oh, I don't know, deviousness about watching people eat hot wings, but you're going to see it coming up at 1 o'clock today. Still time to sign up. Thanks again, Chef John Frankie. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, as you're sampling Chef Frankie's wonderful flat iron steak, please make a donation to Irving Cares, helping stomp out hunger right here in our community of Irving. They need all the help they can get. Just a tremendous community organization. If you can make a donation, please feel free. There is 